Okay, so let's look at this poem by Stephen Crane, A Man Adrift on a Slim Spar. And we're gonna look at this thoroughly, and then we'll look at his other poem, War From War is Kind. So first of all, we have the title. You see that it's similar to some other poems we studied where the title happens to be the first line of the poem. This is kind of typical. A lot of times titles don't mean anything particularly significant to the writer. Other writers take very long to think about what kind of titles they want to use. But from the title, we see that there is an image, a man adrift on a slim spar. So this would be a word that you'd have to look up, spar. What is a spar? Where it's either one of two things. It's either part of a ship or part of a plane. And so when you get to the first stanza, you say a man adrift on a slim spar, a horizon smaller than the rim of a bottle, tented waves rearing lashy dark points, the near wine of froth and circles. God is cold. So in the first stanza here, we have a place where this poem happens, and it is in the ocean. And I've spoken to you previously about how symbolism in poetry is pretty consistent with these big ideas, specifically the ocean is a great symbol for the idea of God because it is unknown, it is deep, it is unfathomable, it is moody, it is dangerous, it is fascinating. Uh, the ocean, if you listed all its characteristics and you listed what one would imagine the characteristics of a creator of the universe would be, well, and our understanding of it, more importantly, um, is uh, this idea of the ocean. So we're in a place of danger from the very beginning because this man is adrift, which means he has no place he's going. He's floating where the sea takes him. And the horizon that he's looking at is smaller than the rim of a bottle. So this is our first feeling of hopelessness. Horizons when you're out at sea are usually a, a beacon of hope because you tend to see land or trees or birds. But this horizon is smaller than the rim of a bottle, which means it's escaping him. These waves in the ocean are tented, which means they're sharp points, right? Lashy, dark points like a tent. The near wine, and here is sound, wine of froth and circles, the white froth of the waves. And then all of a sudden we jump to this declarative sentence that God is cold. So we go to the next stanza. The incessant rays and swing of the sea and growl after growl of crest, the sinkings, green, seething, endless, the upheaval half completed. And then again, God is cold. So looking here, we have a great example of alliteration, A-L-L-I-T-E-R-A-T-I-O-N. Alliteration is the repetition of initial sounds, initial meaning beginning. But it also is just the general sounds of the words used. And there's two kinds of alliteration. The repetition of vowel sounds is called assonance. The repetition of consonants is called consonance. And so here you have a lot of consonants. And specifically the S and G sounds. So you have raise, incessant, raise, swing, see, crest, sinking, seething, endless, half completed. Then you have the G, growl, growl, green, seething, a lot of consonants. And what you are trying to imagine is that the writer is using alliteration to mimic the sounds of where this speaker of the poem is in the sea, what the speaker is hearing, this man that's adrift on the slim spar. So it sounds like the ocean, goo, goo, sh, sh, sh. and then again, this declarative sentence at the end, God is cold. So first two stanzas we have here, five line stanzas, one, two, three, four, five. So that's a quintain. And first two quintains, we have a man who seems in some danger in the middle of the ocean. And the waves are not friendly to him. The waves are not a calm sea. The waves look dangerous. And now we kind of zoom out to this very different tone in the following stanza that's much longer. The seas are in the hollow of the hand. Oceans may be turned to a spray raining down through the stars because of a gesture of pity toward a babe. Oceans may become gray ashes, die with a long moan and a roar amid the tumult of the fishes and the cries of the ships. 
because the hand beckons the mice. And so we have a couple of references for God in this poem. First, we have the whole imagery of the ocean, the symbolism. Secondly, we have the name God repeated several times. And then we have this third reference to this hand that is a formal proper noun, capital T, capital H. And one can surmise that this is the hand of God that he's referring to. And he's saying this hand, who seems to be so helpful when it wants to be, even to help the mice uh, get off of the ship, right? The mice know that when the ship is sinking to go away from the water. But how come this man who is drowning in this ocean, who seems to be bemoaning and criticizing a god, um, he's just got, thinks very poorly of this god. He's talking about this cold ocean. He's talking about this hopeless horizon that doesn't seem to be coming closer, this cold God and this hand that is not helping, even though it is capable, right? That oceans may be turned to a spray. They could rain down to the stars because of a gesture of by the hand of pity towards some baby, or they could become gray ashes, the oceans, or they could die with a long moan and a roar amid the tumult of fishes and the cries of people on ships because this hand will beckon the mice. And then here we go back to our speaker in the middle of the ocean in the last two stanzas a horizon smaller than a doomed assassin's cap. And this is our first foreshadowing of death. And it seems like this death is not accidental because this death seems assassination type intentional. And here again, pointing to the descriptions of the ocean, inky surging tumult, so a dark ocean, a reeling drunken sky and no sky. The sky is always a, a point of hope for us. We look up to the sky, it's seeming like looking up to heaven or the sun or some greater expanse of light. But this sky is drunken, it's irresponsible, it's dangerous, and then sometimes it disappears, there's no sky. And all of a sudden a pale hand, but a lower H, is sliding from a polished spar. And then again, God is cold. Now this hand, this H hand, is different from this hand up here, because this hand is proper, and this hand seems to have some control and decision making in the poem, whereas this hand slides from this polished spar. This hand is letting go or being forced to let go. And then our last stanza is the final image here where the puff of a coat, this human being who is in this water, this man adrift on this slim spar who was wearing a coat whose hand is sliding from the spar. Now he is under the water. His puff of his coat, the last uh, air that was in his clothing before he drowns, this face that's kissing the water death, this weary slow sway of a lost hand that is now going under the water so that the last image we see is not the man adrift on the spar anymore, but this, the sea, the moving sea, the sea, and finally, again, God is cold. So we're looking here at this pattern of stanzas. We have two quintains. Then we have this much longer stanza of, I believe it's an octave. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, oh, nine. So it's nine line stanza, but it certainly breaks the form here. And then we finish with two quintains. So there's some kind of pattern of symmetry. And what is happening in these four stanzas that are all quintains, the symmetrical stanzas of the two in the beginning and the two in the end, is this image of a man that is drowning. And here in the center, we have this kind of exposition stanza that kind of criticizes God in not helping this man. So we have two criticisms of God. Number one, this from the image that God is cold. And when we re realize that the ocean is also the symbol for God, well, we can imagine that this ocean that this man is drowning in is very cold, right? So there's the double meaning here that God in his person and character is a cold person. He's cruel. He's this hand that just decides not to help this man in the ocean. Um, but also the ocean itself is very cold. And then here in the very end, we move through these quintain stanzas from the man who is struggling, stranded, to the man that is giving up or can't hold on any longer, to the man that is now disappeared and is drowned and is buried. And the only thing that we see here is the sea, the moving sea, the sea, as if this man is just one of many men that have drowned, one of many people who has looked to God and who has not received help from this hand. And all we see in the end is this cruel image of God as this moving sea that just devours humankind without helping us in any way.
I like this poem because it shows very beautifully and, and uh, very frighteningly this image of a man who's dying. Um, and it's a moment, right? A moment. And what I really like about um, this is this this repetition of this very simple phrase, God is cold, God is cold, God is cold, God is cold. So what I like to ask my students is, does the speaker of this poem believe in a God? And if you said no, you would certainly be wrong because a man uh, who does not believe in God would not pay so much attention to the idea of God because he wouldn't believe in it. So only a man who believes that a God exists could be this angry with this God. It is because he believes God exists that he is so upset at this God because he determines that this God must be a terrible person. He can do all of these things and yet he allows people to die. He allows men to drown. He allows ships to sink. Um, but sometimes he'll help a baby. Sometimes he'll help a mouse. He's really this fickle, terrible, cruel God. And so um, that is what uh, this poem is about. And this greater context, when we look at the title now after seeing this, is who is this man adrift on the slim spar? It's not just the speaker of the poem who is cataloging the death of this one man. It is every man, every woman. We are all adrift on life. We are all adrift in the ocean. We really are struggling to find direction. Sometimes survival is pure chance or luck, or maybe the favor of some higher being. But this title is emblematic of all of us, that we are all just kind of sometimes holding on uh, in life, holding on to a slim spar, some glimmer of hope, some horizon that sometimes seems smaller than the rim of a bottle or smaller than an assass a doomed assassin's cap. Um, but that uh, this speaker uh, really has a criticism of God in those moments, that God is not there to be helpful. And I jump to um, here, War is Kind, because this is very symbol, uh, I'm sorry, similar. Stephen Crane's War is Kind is also um, this kind of very sarcastic tone. It follows the repetition of War is Kind, War is Kind. Um, he kind of uh, uses a very different pattern here for the stanzas as far as his uh, symmetry, but it is very similar where here he is sarcastically talking about how war is good and war is uh, purposeful and our governments put us to war because the, it's a good thing for the country. But obviously the sarcasm here about the people who die and the women who are left behind, whether they are mothers, sisters, uh, wives, um, they are all left behind. And so this is an address to these women. Do not weep, maiden, for war is kind because your lover threw wild hands toward the sky and the affrighted steed ran on alone. Do not weep, war is kind. Here he's giving an image of death. A man is shot off his horse. And then he pulls out to this horse booming drums of the regiment, little souls who thirst for fight. These men were born to drill and die. The unexplained glory flies above them. Great is the battle God, great in his kingdom, a field where a thousand corpses lie. So talking about this God who loves the glory of war, the glory of victory and death, um, that he is the battle God and great is his kingdom and his kingdom is a death, a thousand corpses, right? Because these soldiers were made to be soldiers and die. And then he's addressed again, do not Weep, baby, babe, for war is kind because your father tumbled in the yellow trenches, raged at his breast, gulped and died. Do not weep, war is kind. Again, giving mention to the child who lost his father. Swift blazing flag of the regiment, eagle with crest and red gold. These men were born to drill and die. Point for them the virtue of slaughter. Make plain to them the excellence of killing in a field where a thousand corpses lie. Talking about the propaganda of war that we sell ideas uh, to our soldiers and to the public to support war. And lastly, mother whose heart hung humble as a button on the bright splendid shroud of your son, do not weep, war is kind. Um, so talking about death, both of these poems uh, by Crane talk about the idea of God, the idea of war, the idea of what the purpose of humanity is. We Were we born to drill and die? Were we born to just die alone in an ocean? Um, the sarcasm, uh, the criticism of God, the criticism of government, just authority and higher powers, the idea of kingdoms, right? And the first one is the kingdom of God and this one, the kingdom of God, but also the governments. So Crane really has this pattern of sarcasm and very blunt 
um, criticism uh, in his poetry. So these are really great poems um, for study. 